Christ. Uh, good evening. This is the policy committee for the Kennett Consolidated School District. Our meeting today on April 24, 2023. Uh, today we are going to review two separate policies. Uh, let's do a roll call and see who's here. Mr. Cronenberg, are you here? Present. Mr. Kohler is here. Uh, Ms. Carrillo is here. Dr. Barber. I'm writing and I write slow. Um, Mr. Finnegan, yep. Dr. Gert, Ms. Patalico, I'm getting there. <laughs> Dr. Gert, I'm putting Jeannie's name first. And then of course myself, we're starting at 6.01 PM. Uh, the first item on our list today is, well, there's two policies that we need to review. One is the weapons uh, policy, and the other one is the controlled substance policy. Uh, the weapons policy is more straightforward than the other, so because there's less changes to it. I will note that earlier a draft was posted on board docs and available to the public. Uh, also, I had an opportunity to review it beforehand. I don't have any comment or suggestions regarding the policy. Mr. Cronenberg, do you have any thoughts? I have no comments or suggestions regarding the policy. Okay, and we also have, so non-committee members who have graced us with their presence, Ms. Carrillo, Mr. Finnegan, Dr. Garrett, Dr. Barber, uh, do you have any thoughts regarding the weapons policy? No. No. Okay. Just the definition of weapon, I just want to make sure everyone's comfortable with that. Yeah, I, I think what we should do is, uh, so the policy itself is good, but under the definitions, weapon includes a uh, replica of a weapon. And as we know, uh, in our modern age, there are things called airsoft, and there are other, that looks exactly like a real firearm. Uh, and then there's knives that look like real knives. <clears throat> I don't, how do we draw the distinction? I would like to draw the distinction, let me put it that way. I would like to draw the distinction that if a child brings in a Nerf gun, they're not subject to a weapons policy and reported to the police and a law issue. Because I think at the end of the day, we realize it shoots a projectile, but uh, Nerfs are not necessarily weapons. They're, they're toys that shoot projectiles. So how do we, without applying too much discretion, include in here that we do not mean a child pointing their finger. Uh, we don't want to call that a replica of a weapon and we don't want to call a Nerf gun. So I leave it open to discussion. Is there something that we can add to this or some way modify this so that we're not making the mistake of over enforcing the policy? But then there are a lot of toys. I mean, parents buy their children toy guns uh, besides the Nerf guns. So where do we draw the line if we're going to put something like that in there? That's kind of, the, to me, the dilemma. I mean, wouldn't you think we almost have to rely on our building administrators to really be able to, to make a call on that? But I, I do. I mean, I want to apply. So in, I agree that we should have a reasonable standard, right? If you go to court, they would apply what is reasonable. Um, but in the world of policy, we have to have something that's black and white in order for that reasonable standard to be applied to. So I'd like to have a discussion about that. Ms. Correa. So I have a, <clears throat> when they make a police report, is this something that you do alone or do you check with your supervisor? You know, like if someone gets a Nerf gun and looks like a real gun, because if you don't have boy, well, if you don't have kids that like um, Nerf guns, it's like, is that real or not? It's obvious that they're toys, but I guess they make that decision with somebody else, right? It's not a, like a one person decision. Right, and that's, but this is the thing we have in there as defined replica of a weapon. So 
let's boil it down a little bit more, is a replica of a weapon uh, something that could be confused with an actual weapon uh, and not a toy? I mean, I we use toy, right, because it is what it is. But a, an airsoft could be considered a toy because kids run around in fields shooting each other with them. Uh, it's not necessarily a weapon, but I will tell you honestly, having seen them, that if somebody came in with an airsoft pistol or rifle, it would take a lot of distinction. Uh, somebody who's not trained, even somebody who's trained would have to physically touch it and look at it. And so if we had someone come in with one, I, I think we need to figure out what's their purpose. Were they going to the park afterwards or was it to get a reaction? So, Ms. Horn, do you have anything to add? Yep, come over to a microphone, please. The the chair recognizes Ms. Horn, a principal Weaver. at New Weaver. Weaver. I'm sorry. My my. So I think our if we can operationalize what the word replica means, um, and then using even the definition that we've posted is that a replica would be something that could cause bodily harm. And I think you're right. I think there are some that are coming into schools that look like real weapons. So I think if we can determine what replica means and that it's consistent among all six schools, then I think it's going to be easier to follow through because is this a code of conduct thing or is this a breach of policy which then brings in kind of more um, or stronger consequences, right? Um, because we've seen both. We've seen a replica that, that looks like a real gun where, you know, we've had to contact to find out. And then we've seen you know, a water gun that looks, it's red, yellow, green, and it looks like a toy gun. So I think if we can work on, my suggestion would be if we can work on the word replica and maybe even using our definition that you have posted about inflicting serious bodily injury, that might help because we should be consistent among all six schools about what constitutes the punishment or the consequence, just my two cents. Mr. Kohler, <clears throat> if we can define intent for bodily injury, if I turn your attention to page three, an exception to this policy may be made by the superintendent who shall prescribe special condi conditions or administrative regulations to be followed. If the superintendent and or the superintendent's cabinet write out administrative regulations that may help support the policy and define a replica as something that would cause bodily injury. And then we can have administrative regulations that follow and coincide with the policy. I think that makes sense because <clears throat> a couple things. One, we don't want to be overly enforcing a rule on a child who makes an easy mistake with a small toy. Uh, on the other hand, though, you want to have the application of discretion so that it's it's not abused. It's a tight line to walk because we don't have a crystal ball, right? We're we're sitting here on April 24th and we're making a policy, but frankly, who knows? I mean, if you'd have gone back in time 15 years ago and said airsoft, people would have no clue what you were talking about because it didn't exist. Uh, maybe it did, and I'm just old, um, but. <clears throat> The, the long and the short of it is, I would, uh, maybe we add an exception to this policy, maybe made by the superintendent who shall prescribe spe special conditions or administrative regulations to be followed. I don't think we need to do more than that. I, I, I would like to leave that as it is. I was thinking that maybe we add something about replica weapons, but if we do that, then it's, we're going to have 17 pages later, and then it's going to be, exactly. So how does uh, the rest of the group feel about relying upon that language for the exercise of reasonable care? 
Have, uh, has anyone discussed this with, with uh, law enforcement? I mean, there, there's two ends of this policy. The one is certainly a first grader being sent in with a, a plastic butter knife to cut an apple. The, is that a knife? Is that a weapon? You have to deal with that. But on the other end, um, you know, at least in recent history, uh, toy weapons should have a red tip on them. Older ones look black. And the ones that don't have red tips can be mistaken by law enforcement as a real weapon, um, putting the the owner of that toy in danger as well. So as far as what can be considered um, a replica or not, has, has law enforcement been consulted? Well, I would, rec I would recommend that uh, Superintendent Blakey confer with the police department. As we know, we had the safety event a few months back and we do have a very good relationship with local law enforcement. I would suggest, and we can recommend to Dr. Blakey when he drafts any kind of policy that he he consult with them because they would know better what's going on in the community with replica firearms. Yeah, because they they may want it more strict just for the the owner's safety, sure. um, not necessarily for our policy. I would like to recommend that we we recommend this policy to the full board, and then at the next school board meeting we have a discussion on the record about uh, implementing procedures on the part of the superintendent, uh, regulations that will be followed by the all six schools. How do you feel about that, Mr. Cronenberg? I agree. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that will be recommend, recommended to the full board. Thank you for your input, Ms. Weaver. Um, next up is the controlled substance policy. This has a lot of points to it. I did take a look through it. Uh, we do have a red line version, which was posted on uh, board docs. Uh, there are multiple overlapping policies. Uh, this too is the reporting policy was, was what stuck out to me. I looked at all the changes that were proposed and I don't have any comment on them except for on, there's a section under enforcement students, there is a paragraph that begins, if a student has violated this policy outside of the boundaries of the school district, the principal shall notify the superintendent who will consider the best interest of the child and the school in determining whether to notify the police. I don't think we can grant that form of discretion. The footnotes at the bottom of that paragraph, which were included, indicate that the, this authority is drawn from Title 22, uh, please specifically there, uh, 22 PA Code 10.21. That's number 17 in the footnotes. 10.21 is immediate notification, and that takes away discretion from administrators as whether or not they should notify the police. So this, the chief school administrator or designee shall immediately notify the police when an offense listed in section 1303, subparagraph A, uh, which includes controlled substances, occurs on school property, at a school-sponsored activity, or on a conveyance as described in the Safe Schools Act, such as a bus providing transportation to or from a school-sponsored activity. And as we know, uh, many of our students participate in activities outside of the district's boundaries, uh, whether it's on an athletic trip, an academic trip, uh, the robotics team. So I don't think, and I'm, like, I'm, I'm certain, that we cannot grant that kind of discretion as prescribed in here. I think it has to be, the statutes require that notification be made to the police if there's a violation of the policy. Do you have any thoughts on that, Mr. Cronenberg? I admit to have not dug into the statutes, so I defer to... You want to say that? I mean, I have an extra copy of it. Thanks. I've, I've got it up as well. Um, I defer to your reading of the statute. I have a concern about um, inconsistent application of justice justice, whether it be on, by the district or by any entity that is notified by the district. Right. And 
I'm uncertain at this time how to address that within this policy. Right. I have a question. Yeah. Um, at what point or at what age should we uh, not call the police? Or is there a certain age when we call the police, when we make the report? Like, I don't see this happening in the elementary school, but fifth grader, fourth grader? I don't, I, I don't think we have any discretion in that regard because the policy is under the uh, Education Act, when you look at Title 22, that's Section 10.21, it says shall notify. And if it happens at a school sponsored event or on school property. So I don't, the, the draft, whoever drafted this drew a distinction between within the boundaries of the school district and outside. So within the boundaries of the school district. So if it happens on, you know, half a mile up here on the corner, is that the boundary? Is the boundary the footprint of the school building? Um, I don't know uh, because that's not defined in here but I don't think it matters because I don't think the statute gives us the ability to differentiate between the two. If it's a school sponsored event or on school property and someone's in possession of a controlled substance, then I think we have to notify the police. Yeah, the, the police could always decide due to the age of circumstances you know, not to have charges brought in, I guess, but that's, that's on them. Um, under the authority, and when you're talking about the, the, the maze and the shells, so I have two questions under that paragraph. The one I know in the last sentence, which, which has been changed from um, shall include exclusion from school, and I understand the changes are making that be May for the circumstances we have now. Um, but I'd like, to, if we're going to do that, um, I'd like to see at least some internal guidelines so you don't have such a variability of what are the conditions when you would or you wouldn't, so it's not 100% subjective. You know, th th this parent's more vocal, therefore we're not going to do it, this one's not. So uh, if we're going to have it be not an automatic uh, um, suspension or expulsion, I I'd like to see some guidelines or rubrics are gonna be followed. Mr. Kohler, may I address Mr. Finnegan's? Oh, uh, oh absolutely, please. Thank yes. you. Yes, so please. Mr. Finnegan, we did come up with a procedure uh, and implement it throughout the year. Uh, rights and responsibilities meetings are in accordance with the law and they are administered but we also do that uh, within my office. And I sit at those meeting, any, meetings any time we're going to have the possibility of extending a suspension beyond three days that deals with this policy and this violation. Um, so we have come forward with a uh, behavioral contract, which includes grades, discipline, attendance. In addition to that, counseling, which we would implement and we have consistently implemented um, with the exception on a case-by-case -case basis of the superintendent depending on extenuating circumstances. But for instance, as a general rule of thumb, I'll give you an example, we could implement, let's say instead of a 10-day suspension, a seven-day suspension, 21 hours of community service, mandatory counseling, 90% attendance, passing grades, um, and no major disciplinary infractions that disrupt the operation of the school building. All that can be codified in a behavioral contract, and that is part of the process that we've implemented um, for policy violations that deal with drugs and alcohol. Good. I was just looking for some consistency. As you remember back in the day when the suspensions could be five to 10 days, that mm -hmm. you would wish they'd all be 10 because it becomes subjective. Every single one goes to a hearing. So right. I'm glad there will be some things in there. And the other one is is the top of that paragraph. I'm thinking way outside of the box here, but um, you know, at a school-sponsored event or activity, no student, guest, visitor, or other person shall be under the influence of, et cetera, et cetera. Does that include employees? Are they the um, other person? I believe we cover employees under the 300s. However, I don't want to misspeak on what policy that is without looking it up. But if an employee is under the influence, then I believe we act in accordance with, and I can get it for you, uh, which would be a policy listed under the 300s for employees who may be under the influence. So going anyway, outside the box, we, we throw a holiday event for teachers, there is alcohol, and according to this policy, they would be an other person who would be under the influence at a school-sponsored event. So I just wanted to see if that was, how that comes in and doesn't contradict with another policy. That, that was all. Yeah, there, there are two policies under employees. There's uh, 351, drug and substance abuse, um, which, which addresses the drug-free workplace, among other things. <clears throat> There's also policy 323, tobacco and vaping products, both of those for employees. 
I'm just looking at the vagueness of other person. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that may want to be considered. Yeah. Um, the, the firm that reviewed the policy thought that we should keep the student language under the student section and anything that we wanted to do with the employees to keep that under the employee section. So um, if you feel we need to look at either of those policies, that I don't know how to correct it. Just the way it's worded, other person doesn't say it isn't an employee. Yeah. So the may need to be another word in this policy okay. uh, to say that employees are covered in addition policies. But as it reads, it doesn't say they wouldn't be. Mr. Kohler, thank you for the statute. Um, Chapter 10, Section 21, uh, describes immediate notification. Chapter 10, Section 22, describes discretionary notification. And I'm not finding quickly, I'm asking if you remember, um, under which circumstances there is required immediate notification and under which circumstances. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what I've just handed you is 24 PS. 13 hyphen 1303A. If you look at 1021 and 1022, so 1021 covers section 4.1 of the statute that I just handed to you. Okay. And it has a list of offenses. And I don't, I never know how to say this when it's lowercase i. So I'm just going to say i, i, i. And I'm not a sailor. Um, so no, actually, i, i under 4.1 lowercase i, lowercase i, the possession, use, or sale of a controlled substance or drug paraphernalia as, designed, as defined by the Controlled Substance Drug Act, correct? So it says that's on there. Those are required. And then the discretionary ones are 4.2. So when you look to the next page, I highlighted 4.2. So rule 10.22. Here, I've I can show you on there if you give me that statute that's on the table there. Right. So this says the 4.1 is required. Mm -hmm. This says 4.2 is discretionary. So as you read that statute, controlled substances are required. However, simple assault, terroristic threats, and harassment are discretionary, as if that makes any sense. Yeah. I was looking at this expectancy a lot. More. Fewer. Right. <laughs> so when you look at Section 4.1, it does include the Controlled Substance Act. When you look at 4.2, which would then invoke Section 10.22, that's the discretionary one. So simple assault, recklessly endangering. So controlled substance. Yeah, under 4.1 of that section. <laughs> My recommendation would be well, we, where we have the section that says notice to police, we would put upon the determination that a student has violated this policy, strike the language within the boundaries of the school district. The principal shall notify the police as required by local, state, or federal codes and statutes. And that actually works because this draft already has footnotes to the applicable statutes, rules, etc. So I think that paragraph that comes after notice to police, where it draws the distinction of off the property, I think we should just strike that and clean the language up in the paragraph before that essentially says, it's not discretionary if the law dictates that it be notified. Any thoughts? Hearing none. Okay. All right, well, with that change, I would recommend this policy to the full board. How do you feel about that, Mr. Cronenberg? Just to clarify my understanding, this is to keep the policy in keeping with applicable state, federal, and local codes. Right. I don't think so. Well, I, I, I know. Well, I don't know. Who knows? Right. Um, I'm fairly certain that the state statute does not give us the ability to grant discretion to the superintendent. Yeah. So I think as a board, we have to follow the state law. Absolutely. And if there's a, if there is a huge upswell of, of objections to it, then I'm certain that uh, either Senator Committee or 
Representative Sappy would be more than willing to listen to the constituents about changing that statute. Yep. Yeah, I just want to bring up again, I think we should either define or other person in authority or strike it. All right, which, pay, which paragraph are you? Want? It's uh, authority. Authority. So it's a third topic. Well, you don't see any pages I do, but. Second sentence ends with no student, guest, visitor, or other person shall be under the influence. So the draft that I have is that struck. So it is struck. Okay, this is the one we emailed. Yeah, this was uh, this was a, a draft that okay. was put on board docs. It already strikes that language. And I think if you look at the definition slightly above that, under the influence, clear is defined as a control of substances by a student in this policy. So I think with that language being struck and that definition, I think we're on pretty solid ground. Okay. And Mr. Finnegan, I can email you a copy of this draft, the red line that was up on the board docs. It, yep. Okay. Is there any other thoughts? I'm just going to restate for the record um, my concern about inconsistent application of justice um, by any entity. Um, that the school may that the district may not be responsible for uh, regardless of our requirements of notification that being said the statute is clear and our responsibility is clear to draft policy that follows statute understood and and i think we can rely upon the superintendent and our assistant superintendent to draft a policy that's basically specific and not arbitrary I, I completely agree. Yep. There are entities that are not under our control that are going to be drawn into this. Sure. That we are not responsible for. Yep. yep. All right. I think that concludes our business. It is uh, the clock on the wall says 626 p.m. Uh, that concludes our meeting. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I'm happy to if you'd like. I've never seen no, you want them? You can have them. Yeah. I've got a nice bulging file folder. I'd pay for it.
Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the curriculum committee meeting of April 24th. Um, on the committee is myself, Ann Parry, committee chair, Dr. Garrett, who's also the president of the board, and um, Ms. Carrillo, Mrs. Carrillo. <laughs> um, did I get it? All right. Um, we also have Mr. Finnegan here and Mr. Cronenberg from the board. Um, he's in the audience. Mr. Kohler's in the audience. There he is, <laughs> giving us a wave. T uh, tonight we're going to be discussing um, and hearing about the process of selecting iReady, um, the math program, and we'll also be reviewing an AP environmental science textbook. So it should be a pretty straightforward curriculum committee meeting. Before we officially start, I just wanted to remind us of our board goal statement. Um, Kennett Consolidated School District strength is its bilingual and multicultural community. In alignment with the district's vision and mission, the board charges our administration to build on that strength with an educational system that enables all of our students to succeed, no matter their origin or primary language. So with that, we'll get started. Good evening. Uh, this evening we have um, a couple of things to go over with everyone here, and we have teachers uh, with us this, this evening, a wide variety, a variety, and so I'd like to give them time to also share their experience, um, if they wish, uh, about the pilot. And what we'll do is we'll, if you want to speak, we'll use the mic right at the end of uh, Dr. Bar, at the end of uh, Dr. Barbie's lane. We have two rotating seats. If you'd like to come up and share, we'll get to that point. But <laughs> we will. This is a fun group, so this is going to be exciting. Um, but first, we'll go through a couple of things. I'll turn it over to Dr. Miller so she can go through our process, um, how we got to the pilot, and what our next steps are. So I'll turn this over to Dr. Miller. Okay. Don't worry. You don't have to say it. Like I saw the faces, just your casual thoughts. It's, this is a very um, flexible group, and, and they just are excited that you um, took the time out of your evening to be here. So just to... Um, kind of refresh everyone about our timeline. Um, we built off of some of the work that happened last year with our um, math committee. And um, one of those big findings was the need for um, intervention materials. Um, so we reconvened the K-8 math committee in, um, this past December. And one of the things that we discussed was um, it's very hard to find intervention materials um, for math if the core program um, itself isn't necessarily meeting the needs of the students. And um, in addition, the current um, edition of Math and Focus that we have, the 2016 edition, um, is out of print um, starting this year. So we would have actually had to order materials before the conclusion of the 2022 calendar year um, so that they could get us the copies. However, we thought that we would need our due diligence to make sure that was the best decision. So we moved forward with um, reviewing four math programs in January of 2023. Um, we, of course, looked at the 2020 edition of Math and Focus. Um, we also looked at Reveal Mathematics, Illustrative Mathematics, and iReady. So back in um, early February, after the different presentations from the meetings, we um, took a survey to see what programs we would like to pilot. Um, and after, <laughs> we're still in February, we're good. And after um, we took a look at the programs um, and which ones we wanted to pilot, um, it came back very strong that um, the committee wanted to take um, a close look at just um, iReady Mathematics Classroom. So then we worked um, in February and April to, um, to get that pilot. And it was um, a quick turnaround. And we recognized that, um, however, our timeline, um, because of the various circumstances, um, it was aggressive but we were able to offer the pilot in our K-8 mathematics classrooms. Um, grade levels were able to choose a unit to pilot that went along with their um, current sequence of curriculum as close as it, it could because there are some differences between um, 
the amount of topics presented in the iReady Mathematics classroom versus Math and Focus. Um, and those topics are more aligned in the iReady to um, the Pennsylvania state standards. Um, so some P um, grade levels have concluded the pilot and a few grade levels are um, continuing that work based on the results that they're seeing in their classrooms or based on um, the desire to kind of just dig into the materials a little bit more. Um, and other grade levels with the PSSAs and state testing have decided that um, it would be best to, to stop. So um, that's kind of where we are right now with um, the pilot. And so we're here today to share with you a little bit about um, the iReady Classroom Mathematics um, in anticipation of presenting it in May um, as a recommendation for adoption. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, we can do the next slide. Oh, Judy's got the clicker. Dan, help me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then um, we'd like to put that up for the 30-day review this coming May with hopeful, hopeful um, approval for June of 23, and then um, beginning this summer have um, com committee members um, or additional teachers come to do some summer curriculum work around taking a look at um, the materials, um, working on getting curriculum maps updated and um, put into our new power school um, curriculum warehouse and talk about like things like um, computational fluency and where we stand and um, get everyone familiar with the materials. And then in August, officially start um, with professional development for the entire staff. So I guess any initial questions on the timeline, the process, or, or anything? Um, yeah, just to fill everyone in, um, potentially in the audience or other board members who aren't in education, can you describe the relationship between the standards, a curriculum, and purchasing a program? Mm -hmm. So the standards guide what in the instruction that the students should um, obtain by the end of their grade level. The curriculum is how we map it out as a district, and the program is more of a tool and a vehicle to help um, students and teachers access the material that's required to achieve the standards. I think a lot of times people hear buying a program and they think, wow, we're changing right. everything. And really the standards have stayed the same. We're mm -hmm. just trying to reach the standards through right. different materials. Through different materials. Yeah. And with the case of this program, reaching the standards, um, this is more aligned to that to the PA standards to allow for more depth. Um, so the alignment is there, and then it also um, provides additional resources for teachers and students to help enrich, remediate um, different paths. Mm -hmm. But it's it's. Um, it's not we're not program specific, like it's program driven, but it's more driven by the standards. Yep. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have questions? Okay. okay. No, we'll just <laughs> so um, I think so. If we can just start, just make sure, and if anyone wants, just give like their initial feelings of how <sighs> things are going um, with the the pilot, how you feel, like things that, yep, we can talk about that. This is, yes, before we get to you, all right, we could talk about this slide yeah. too. So we did survey the committee, uh, the K-8 uh, math committee, which did include, we call it the K-8, but it did have two um, high school teachers that sat on there. They didn't pilot, obviously, the materials, but they did provide um, some insight and um, thoughts to our discussion. Um, so those are the survey results of how comfortable um, the committee was with moving forward to iReady Mathematics. And we took, um, we said at the committee meeting that a three and above 
neutral and above would um, count as as us moving forward. And then we have some additional committee comments. Um, oh. All right, we'll work on the access and then come back. Um, not sure. And so the, with the comments we, we had, what we did was during the committee meeting, we had an um, share out where tables of different um, grade levels, wrote down both strengths and opportunities for the program. Um, and then at the um, conclusion of that survey as well, there was um, some room for additional comments, concerns. Um, some of the things that came up were, you know, we did not have the entirety of the materials available to us during the pilot. And that's just um, inherent to a pilot. Um, we can't get all of the materials. Um, so we did um, work with iReady Classroom to get as much of the materials, the text, the student text as possible. Um, we had complete access to the diagnostic, um, the teacher toolbox, which is like the online platform that has the resources um, available, but we didn't have things like the discourse cards, um, and we didn't have like the manipulatives that may have been exactly specific to the program. So there were a few things that we didn't have. Um, additionally, we did have professional development during the pilot, um, which we had to work within um, the confide of our PD schedule. So we did um, have to do some during collaborative team time, which is a hard turnaround um, when you're teaching then you go and get 50 minutes of professional development and then you're right back in the classroom. So we did recognize and understand that that was some of the concerns. And one of the things was, will we support this with professional development? And we are, we have assured the, commi um, the committee that we are committed to the necessary amount of PD to have everyone feel comfortable and confident with um, the mathematics instruction. Um, there was also discussion, and very as as there should be about the ELD supports. Um, so, iReady um, is WIDA um, supported. So they they passed um, that they work. They provide act, um, actual supports with speaking, listening, writing, write in the manual for teachers. There's discourse cards that help. Um, with the academic language. Um, the family portal is available in, in a, nearly like 11 languages. Um, there are videos for families to watch that can be, um, that have closed captioning in Spanish. So there are a lot of ELD supports and with the pilot, we only got to the surface of them because since it is a new edition as well, it's a 2024 edition, um, the Spanish materials were not released yet. We had some sample books of the Spanish materials, but everything is fully, um, that's in English, is fully aligned in Spanish as well. Um, and they have given us their timeline of release, which will start in June. And they have, according to their timeline, all materials will be released prior to the start of the 23-24 academic year. Um, a, a question on the on the pilot. It, yeah. There's there's more total uncomfortable and neutral than there are comfortable. Is that typical of a pilot? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I took we took into account for some of the comments of. So we asked like when we were looking at when they marked themselves uncomfortable, and a lot of it was just more in more time of needing more time to get used to the resources, still feeling uncomfortable about the professional development. And I could say it's probably typical to feel uncomfortable at times, like when you're switching something new. And some of the comments that when we were reading and that we experienced during the committee was really around um, not fully understanding. Um, the program is very robust uh, and has a lot of resources at their fingertips. And so sometimes mm -hmm. not being able to get to the depth of 
the entirety of the program because they're coming in in the springtime as a pilot versus understanding that the flow of where students should be in the spring was not where some of our students were. Mm -hmm. And so um, their comments were reflective of just needing more information, mm -hmm. wanting to know heavily. I mean, one of the main things was how much and how deep can we get with professional development? Because we're also talking um, about elementary teachers who are trained as well-rounded content specialists, reading teachers, math, and everything, but they want more content-driven professional development. Um, and is that going to be provided? And so we were like, yes, it, we'll get to the depth of all of that. So that's where mm -hmm. that uncomfortable sense came from when we looked at the comments mm -hmm. yeah. and what we were, the feedback we were given. And I think Mrs. Wesselman would like to talk. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think... I, I answered the question, and I think that my idea of being uncomfortable or comfortable had more to do with the speed that we picked the pilot, and I didn't really, I mean, while we had great presentations from multiple companies, that was them trying to sell us their programs. So I ready, like, stood leaps and bounds ahead of all of the other presenters as, hey, this is what they have to offer, and then when you actually pilot and it was the 2024 edition and all the things they said they had maybe didn't pan out because it was 2024 edition and we didn't have everything. Um, I don't know. I think my level of answering that question of comfort or discomfort had more to do with, I'm not sure I'm comfortable saying this is the best thing out there because I don't know what else there, if, if there's something that's even better. So I don't, I mean, part of the, is the interpretation of the question mm -hmm. maybe too. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's kind of where I was going with this. I mean, it, it, it's obviously not a slam dunk, but was that typical of pilots? Because if there's that much level of, of uncomfort or, or neutrality, um, are you going to have problems with, with adoption um, and acceptance and people you know, getting into it if they didn't like it that much in the first place? That's, that's my concern there because we've gone through programs before where we've put new programs in and then they weren't the best thing out there. So mm -hmm. um, it's just... That concerns me, that's also, it may be in the comments, but yeah. I had to bring that up. Yeah. Um, Mr. Finnegan, I, there are two things I wanted to add. One is um, a lot of our teachers said as we were going through the processes that they were also preparing for the PSSA. So they weren't giving all of their attention to the pilot all the time because they wanted to make sure that the kids were ready for eligible content on starting the PSSA starting tomorrow. So that was one thing they said, you know, like we've only had a little bit more time, but we needed to make sure we could do this presentation tonight in order for it to be ready for the June board meeting. So they, you know, they, they really wished, you know, they could have had another couple of weeks just to explore a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is that when I'm looking at this, and again, I was an ELA teacher, not a math teacher, but I'm, I'm looking, our numbers are comfortable and un, and very comfortable, looked to me about 58%. So I think that is pretty typical of a, of a, a pilot. Yeah. Thank um, you. Just, you know, I'm curious from the teacher's perspective, what are the benefits you've seen from the pilot of this program versus what we were using before? Oh, no, I think, well, we'll sit, I'll have them sit down. Hey, Dr. Barber. Okay. Hi, principal. He's our principal. <laughs> I um, actually student taught here in 2002, so I've been here for ever since. Um, this is my fourth math program. I love Kenneth. This is my fourth math program. I started with um, Houghton Mifflin. We moved on to investigations, math and focus, and now we're looking at iReady. So the best way that I presented it to my uh, colleagues was that it takes the best of investigations, it takes the best of math and focus, and it puts them together. And I think that at the K Center, we didn't, we don't have the pressure of testing. We're not a testing year, so we were able to um, take a little bit more time. And we actually, um, my colleagues are here with me as well. Um, we actually put together um, folders for the students, for every student here at the K Center. Every single student has a folder with all of the materials in it with reproducibles, and then we also have a toolkit. Oh, Dr. Garrett has it. We also put together toolkits where we took all of the manipulatives that we've had in our possession from investigations, math and focus, and we made sure that every classroom here at the K-Center had all of the, um, everyone has the same materials to use for the pilot. 
So we took, um, like if I had boxes and boxes of cubes, we all shared out the cubes, the bears. And so that way every student in our school had everything the same for the pilot so that everyone had the materials they needed to be successful. We did find um, that, of course, a pilot is difficult for anyone. You know, you're, you're stopping your instruction and you're in the groove and then you're changing to do something else. Um, we as the math committee thought that it was, it was really fun. Um, um, I was so excited. Um, Jen told me I had to wait until PD and then I could use iReady. But um, I'm still going forward with the program. We stopped at lesson 20. We did one um, session and uh, myself and a couple of our, uh, my colleagues are moving on to lesson 21. So what we started with was numbers and um, to five addition. And now we're on numbers to, um, I'm sorry, 10 subtraction. And what we found were difficult in the first lesson for us as well as the students is now very um, familiar to them. So the activity stayed the same. The uh, math, uh, we, were, we switched our math problems, but our activity stayed the same. So it was familiar. And we had a lot of um, positives from the staff. We had at one of our faculty meetings, I just gathered quick positives and, and um, opportunities that we could um, tell the board and, and to our committee what we wanted to see and what we saw as positives here at the K-Center. Um, a lot of discussion. And for the littles here in the school district, it was a major benefit to our kids because we were really talking about math. And uh, one of our activities, you had to pull a card out of a bag and you're telling your friends a math problem, a math story. And this today, we heard some of our kids, our ELD students and our students who are, are um, English language learners using vocabulary and pictures that were on our I Wonder cards. And they're telling stories about soccer and about kids in bleachers. And I mean, those were our vocabulary words last week. So we, we've seen success in seven days of using this program as compared to Math and Focus. And in full transparency, the Math and Focus program that we're using now was actually written for a half day program. And obviously we've been full day for a while. So we are supplementing a lot um, here at the Case Center for Math and Focus. Um, the one thing that we noticed um, from our other uh, grade levels is that we are not worksheet. Um, heavy when it comes to the case center. We have assessment that is objective and we have the students who are doing hands-on activities and we're, we're watching and hearing and having them explain to us what it is that they're finding and using their math vocabulary to explain to us. It's not just pencil and paper. It's real world conversations and just a lot of um, experience for our students going forward. I'm sorry, did I go too far? So I, I know Ms. Lawson yes. probably don't remember me, but I, do. I, I remember you from many, many years back at kindergarten and center. And, you know, like uh, she has a lot of energy and, and she and she's very passionate about teaching. And when I heard you talking about the book, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to talk. I don't talk as well, you know, but um, I just want to tell everyone that I went through this book and um, almost every single page. I know everything in here, so I don't know what grade this is, but I think I can do everything. <laughs> but this book looks like me, and I'm sure this book looks like many of our kids. You know, you can see tamales in there, pictures of tamales, people from India, from Africa, people with disabilities, um, Talavera tiles, I don't know if you know what that is. You can see pictures of the new year, um, the lunar new year, Vietnamese food, it's like amazing. So just by looking at the book, you're like, oh my gosh, look at that piñata. So the kids are going to identify with every picture, not just Latinos. This is like a mix of, you know, different um, people with different cultures. So I love the book and I wanted to do everything in the book. <laughs> well, I don't know what grade this is and I'm, I'm curious. Oh, I'm like, oh, I know third grade. So it's fourth grade. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, so the thank cultural... You. Um, the cultural connection is something that um, I already emphasized in our initial PD. There's also little um, pages called STEM connections to um, help students see perhaps um, a future career path or choice um, in a graphic 
novel type format, like a comic, so highly engaging. Um, but that is one of the things that they um, did emphasize. And then you can see that in the what they call the try it portion of the lessons, um, getting the students to talk. And it's often about cultural topics that can create rich conversation for students. What I really like about this is that we've been talking about the discussion piece that students are get able to speak. And I think that's, you know, something that I've seen in math instruction in elementary is that we used to just say, okay, if that has less than in the problem, it's subtraction. And that, that's not what it is anymore. I mean, the students really have to understand what the story is saying, and it's kind of there to trick them. Um, are they reading the story? Do they have a picture of what's happening in their mind? Then they can turn it into the math equation. Um, and then, it, you know, that's leading them to this other kind of reasoning. So it's really interesting that the first thing we heard was kindergartners are able to connect with their personal experience and use their voice to describe what's happening. And that, to me, is that building block that will lead us to future success with the older students too. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been really excited to start this new program. Um, even have the shoes for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I just broke it up into like the students and the teachers. Um, so for the students, it um, allows all students to be active learners. Um, it gives every session gives the opportunity for students to do the turn and talk. Um, which we have um, in our Fountas and Pinnell program. And we also have the mini lesson, which teaches the students how to do that. So I felt with doing that all year with our Fountas and Pinnell program, that when we started the iReady, they knew like who was my partner, who what I, would, I turned to. Um, and then one of our trainers also suggested um, when they're, we have the number talks every day, it starts out with a number talk that, um, to give all the students that wait time that um, you're not right away calling on, you know, a student that always wait, raises their hands. And she would say, you know, if you can find one way, you know, hold one finger up. If there's two ways, then two. So you're making every student accountable that they're at least holding one finger up and able to share. Um, and then they turn to their partner and they talk with their partner. Um, and then we share as a group. So everyone is an active um, learner and participating. Um, another thing with the students, it allows choice. So um, with the manipulatives, like if they want to use the counting bears, they can use their counting bears. If they want to use the connecting cubes, they use their connecting cubes. So you give them that choice. It's in their toolbox. They choose what they feel comfortable using. Um, and then even in the workbook, there was um, one of the um, pages where they have to color. They even had the choice of what colors they wanted to choose four colors and they were able to choose the four colors. It wasn't, you know, you know, if it's four, you have to color it red. So it gave them that choice. So they're, you know, taking ownership in their learning. Um, for the teachers, every session had a slide deck provided um, that you can download and from the um, number talk all the way to when it was time for the centers, it's all listed out. So there's no time that we would have to take to prepare that slide deck for our presentation. Um, all the pieces were there for us. So it'd be more time for us to spend on how to implement the program than trying to create a slide deck or searching for resources for that. So, um, and then, um, all the materials, you know, are available for the centers for um, all the levels of the students. So again, we wouldn't, in the past, you know, we'd have to find materials to accommodate all of our students, but there's plenty, you know, available in that toolbox for us, so. You can just leave that on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Conrad. Um, 
I've been around a long time. I don't want to say how many math curriculums I've done, but okay. So 30 years, Becky and I have been here. Um, I'd like to address, um, Mr. Finnegan, your concern. Well, and it's valid about um, some of those lower numbers. I'm a fourth grade teacher, and um, so we, at least in our building, our, um, how we kind of reflected on this wasn't just from people on the math committee. So we spent a lot of time in PLCs with our team. We all piloted it, not just math committee members. So there are some people who really just love math. And there are other elementary teachers that are phenomenal at teaching math, but this is not their first choice um, as far as they're not coming to the committee. And so they weren't part of the whole process. Um, and it did make it a little bit more challenging for some people um, to pick up the materials with not full professional development. We had professional development, but it was available at our planning times. Um, and so it was, it just, um, I think it was reflected in that more so than what the program has. Some of the concerns that we had in the middle grades were the lack of translation that we thought was coming and it is coming. But, you know, when we went to the presentations, they told us that they would have materials and they weren't ready for the pilot. Um, so it made it, some of those pieces difficult. Our students were doing a lot of critical thinking and it was fabulous. It was really set up well. Um, we started with slides of what do you notice or always, sometimes, never. Um, many open-ended questions that were accessible to everyone at all levels. Everyone was involved in the discussions to start, so it hooked everybody in. Um, we're working through uh, using the materials and it was a little bit of a change in pacing and it a much deeper dive, um, more focused on the standards, not so many extra things. And so we were also under the time that we were heading to the PSSAs in the middle grades. And we had planned our year with, you know, boulders of what we needed to get to. Um, and then we were kind of trying to give due diligence to do the pilot and give it the best it can. So we had a week where we weren't, we were going back to teach routines that were iReady routines so that the pilot could be successful and we could get a feel for what worked. Um, and I do think that that caused a little bit of anxiety in some people. But now the payoff to that was once we were into the pilot, we could get a true taste of how the pilot worked because the kids understood the procedures, the, the students understood the expectations. Um, and I, I've taught with a lot of math programs. And, and this, this has a lot of fabulous things. One thing that I haven't heard addressed is there is a really amazing online component that is part of the program and it is adaptive and responsive to each individual student. Um, it was highly engaging. The kids loved it and very um, focused. And the data that was provided to me when I was seeing small groups, I could see exactly what they were working on, exactly what they needed. Um, it, it, it was it, the, the, that piece I think can't be um, underestimated. It, it's huge and that they wanted to do it. And, um, it was so well put together. Um, it far exceeds any math um, online component I've seen. Not in 30 years, because there was no online. <laughs> I was but, gonna say, we just so, started that. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we've, had, we've, had online, we, we've had online practice maybe a good 15 years. Yeah. Um, maybe 20, but I mean, really just a, an out, they, that's a huge piece of it that was an outstanding job. Right. Yes. So okay. how does that compare? Because we were doing Alex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I know that kids, you know, no, this didn't is really love highly that. engaging. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> Alex um, was much more of just a basic fact yeah. and they had a component that was a path or a pie uh, to support online learning, but this is engaging. This is interesting and fun, and it moves at a pace. However, if the students put in the wrong answer, it gives them another try with prompt. 
if they put in another wrong answer, then it pops up with a try this and walks them through. Then they get a third um, try through to get it. Then it gives them the answer and then it gives a little explanation. So they're not, they can't, it, it makes it very difficult just to click through um, to get finished. It really is about um, having them show what they know in all different situations. It's where we can expand um, to some of the multicultural things and real life problems where it's giving it just a huge variety of examples. And they had a lot of fun with it. They, they really enjoyed it. In fact, um, we, because the PSSAs, we stopped the pilot last week and, but we still have the online component and we have kind of both Alex and and some of our report card standards are written towards Alex, you know, goals, mm -hmm. getting their quick tables, getting, and in the morning now the kids are like, can I do I ready? I'm like, you, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and they want to do that. It's not something that we have to, okay, you haven't finished your Alex today. They are asking to do that. Um, we had an indoor recess. They asked if they could do I ready. I mean, that's a huge, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, and I don't know that, they realize how much they're learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and and don't get me wrong, man. I, I thoroughly like trust oh. and respect oh, yeah. all your opinions selecting it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fifty eight percent. If that was in the test, it's not a perfect good grade. Um, yeah, I, I just want to make sure that you've been through five programs already. That this isn't just this is better than we had, but is it is it the one we want? Um, but I'm satisfied of all the extenuating yeah. circumstances as to why. You got what you got without it being able to read the comment yet. So, so don't get me wrong on that. No, one, yeah, but, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's a great, it. a great observation mm -hmm. because I, I do think that people um, had had a little bit of a concern, and there is a piece where the hand because math and focus do, it went out, it is out of print, so it's not that we have that piece of, and, you know, ideally I would have loved to have seen math and focus have something to hand us to pilot for at least some type of consistency or, um, but the, I, I'm happy with this. I think that this has everything we may need. And then some, I feel that for the interventions, for the language based, our PSYOP goals, that this is really where um, the program hit it out of the park. It, it's a program for all of our students. It, it sounds that way from what I'm hearing. It's a great program. And it's, um, you know, I guess the timing of the pilot with PSSAs and everything else going on that, you know, hopefully we we'll wanted to go through a sixth or, or I can say seventh at that point math program in a few years. But whatever programs <laughs> yeah. we want to evaluate for any departments, we should make sure that there's a nice free chunk of time where it can be mm -hmm. properly evaluated. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I don't know that all the places had their, because I think they're all trying to align with the standards. And I just think. Yeah, I, I think there's a multitude of factors that we could yeah. certainly get into about an ideal time to pilot. Um, however, we were dealt the cards we had um, with the timing. Um, our curriculum cycle is a little bit off. Um, as far as when materials are reviewed and um, implemented. So that is something that the, the teaching and learning team is. Um, yeah, and I don't know is, if there's anything directly the board can do to help yeah. set aside pilot time that's more administration, but you know, if, yeah. if there was, let us know. Absolutely, yeah. So I wanna revisit too before um, Mrs. Stinson um, speaks, but our timeline here, um, just to be clear, when uh, this this work actually started last year with the K-8 math committee, the recommendation at the springtime um, curriculum mini, because I was here, I remember that, was to explore supplemental materials because the program did not meet the needs of the students. Math and Focus only um, taught 44% of the grade level standards. And that was, the, the committee was aware of that work at that time. So in the fall, what our teaching and learning team took time to do was visit Ed Reports, which is a national, um, almost like bank of curriculum where they evaluate for the effectiveness on four gateways. The first two gateways are one, gateway one is the standards. Does it actually teach your state standards? Um, so we went through all of the curriculum and pulled out all the ones that met gateway one, then we looked at gateway two was, how are the student outcomes and measurements? 
So it, we, we only looked for programs that met all four gateways with green across, across the board. Um, so that work was done. So I don't know out there, that's how we got to the four programs, mm -hmm. which was, uh, and really Math and Focus didn't meet that, that, didn't meet the first gateway, but we did our due diligence as a committee because that was our current program in to look at the 2020 version um, and can do a comparison. Mm -hmm. Then Reveal Mathematics, Illustrative, and iReady were the only math programs who met those gateway thresholds. Um, so as far as what else is out there, um, those were the three programs, and that's why we br brought them into the committee. So I just wanted to revisit that only because I think that's important to think through in this moment. Um, and so that was a recommend recommendation after last year. And then there was a change in our department too. So mm -hmm. like I was new, Jen was new. So when you look at those components, you know that you can't set, our goal was not to also make, we wanted to make sure to what Ms. Conrad was just talking about, that the teachers had everything they needed to be successful. Um, and to supplement a program at the level we were going to have to supplement would have put a great burden on the teachers in our district. And so we had to make a decision, and that is why we involved the committee. We expanded the committee. At one point, we have 40 people sitting there, and we ended up with a 31-person team, which is great. So I just wanted to kind of bring us back to that piece mm -hmm. um, so we're not lost on where we started. Um, so I appreciate your comments, too, and, and our conversation here, too, because it does keep this at the forefront of the importance of the work we're doing. Yeah. And, and, uh, and one and, last thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And then additionally, no. even today, we were um, at a... Um, an IU meeting with other curriculum counterparts in the county. Um, and there are many other districts in our county that are looking at iReady Mathematics. And um, once they heard that we had already piloted the materials, they were looking to to reach out to us to talk about it um, because, they're, because of some of the comments the teachers have said tonight about the MyPath um, the online, that online learning component, the diagnostic, which helps um, appropriately and accurately place the students, um, the resources, and then um, specifically a lot, as you heard, the, the discourse, um, the amount of discussion that um, sits in the, in the, in the lessons um, is what people are, are most interested in and what is aligned with current mathematical practices. Sorry, sorry, Sue. No worries. So I'll be quick, but um, this is the first time we've all been able to pilot it. It's the first time that we actually had professional development with a pilot, and the iReady people were very responsive, and like we as second graders, second grade teachers, we met at all. I feel like a second grader. <laughs> I think and dream in second grade. Um, so I've been here 17 years, and I've taught for 28. So um, I've seen many things come, and I agree that it is a combination of a lot of the programs. Um, the depth that this is going to go in, we, as second grade across the district, second grade is known in our district that we are a solid team. We work well together across all buildings, um, that we pick the shapes, the Unit 5, which is at the end of the year. And what we noticed right away is the depth that they went into. Like, they didn't do all shapes. We, we, we dealt with the rectangle. And we really, it's probably the first year we depth, we went really, and the middle school will like this because only because I know a little middle school. Um, but um, the quadrilateral, it was before it was a passing thing where we really went deep into it. And that beginning slide, that what do you notice? Because there are three reads. And that's the thing that's about the lessons is you go over three reads of, you know, what do you notice and, you know, what's important in the question and things like that. And every one of the lessons has a different multicultural. The other day we were in Pakistan with tiles. Today we were in an Irish um, dancing thing. How many, how many square tiles? And this particular lesson is partitioning the rectangle. It's just to get them ready for area next year. And then we're going to do a raise. So for us, one of the things is we look forward to, to working with iReady um, next year. And because some of the things is that, and you should see what the online program is. It's remarkable. And the kids do love the path. There's, there's the path and then there's the games. And I will tell you that our, and I know how to turn the games off. Um, um, 
I'm old. You have to earn the games. But the speech teacher has said to me one day, he said, what is this pizza thing? Because it's a game that goes across all the classes from, from one to five and probably even kindergarten. And because he's like, everybody's talking about the pizza game. Well, the pizza game is what they do is they design a pizza. They sell the pizza. They have to make the change. You can't get any more real life than that. And they enjoy it. So, and the other thing is the path, the diagnostic puts them in, it's probably, it put them in a, in a place where they could use it and where the maps is great, but that's just data for me. It doesn't put them somewhere. And there was a child in my room who is accelerated and like we have math seeds down, but in order for me, I have to move him up to third grade, but he's working at a fourth grade level where the I ready path put him where he wanted to be. And he said, I'm, this is great because he's doing something that other than me, and now that I know that we're not doing math and focus next year, I go to fourth grade math and focus and take this stuff. But unless that's the only way that we can enrich him, but here on his path, he can do it. Now, and I ready was very responsive. And yes, I'm gonna say, their, their quizzes online are very rigorous. And there's a lot of words and a lot of drop downs. And we've explained to the kids they need that, and especially in second grade, because they're gonna have to use it in third grade, especially when they take the PSSAs. I said, you have to get used to that. Um, we can read the test to them. We would love I ready to read the test to them, but we know there are reasons. But they we wrote an email. We no, no, we wrote an email to them as part of their customer support. They got right back to us. And so that just shows how responsive they are. Um, I think, and for us in Greenwood, we're continuing on because we, we're going to just take what we had as our boulders and we're just going to go into the iReady things so that we can do it. Because the more we play in iReady right now, the better off we will be. Because we, and because thanks to the board, we have more in service next year. Because the more we invest in that, what we got out of Math and Focus is that we had the consultant come to our school and spend time. They went around to all the buildings and we had regular discussions with them. And they were teachers um, that taught the program. So I think that moving forward, we've got kids who everybody can answer that first. What do you notice? You know, is it sometimes always never? And we've got kids who normally would never speak at all that once they talk, they think it themselves, they talk to their partner, I've got more hands up than I normally would because it's open-ended. And I think the more, and the first day is all explore. So there is no wrong way because they figure it out on themselves and they talk with their partners. And then it's, we come up through the cleanup crew and make sure they're headed on the right math, math path, talking together, so. <laughs> And hopefully what we do will help you. Piggyback on what everybody said. So we have the three reads, six middle school, and it's, sorry, sixth grade middle school. Three reads, We that's some, it's not that it's new, but it was such an idea to just say, hey, we're going to read three times, and each time you read it, there's a different purpose. So you, I think all of you talked about that. And then the first thing you do is think on your own. And it's kind of the same, when you said you have the same routine, it's the same routine but a different problem. And then you turn and talk. And you, and Every single time you have a problem to try it on your own, discuss it, and then you connect it. You share your ideas, you share with the class, you, and then you connect it to previous learning, connect it to world, different world ideas, connect it with each other, and then you apply it to new things. So it's kind of like just a great, um, it is like the best of combining, you said, um, like we called it CMP, you called it uh, investigations. Um, so you take the best of what I what um, math and focus has, what investigations has. Now I will say, we, in middle school we use IXL. So you guys say, hey, you, you've never seen IXL is pretty great. Like there's things about IXL that are better and worse. Like it's they're different things. Um, IXL has that repetitive practice that some of our students need, and some of our students don't need the repetitive practice. I would say like the iPath, the MyPath. It doesn't have that repetitive practice. It's always a challenging question where some, if, if you always are connecting to like multiple ways of doing the problem, sometimes some kiddos get lost in that process. They never master one way. 
So I will say one thing that I thought was maybe a little lacking was like that repetitive practice of mastering one strategy. Um, but it's always good to see all of the different strategies. Um, they also, I thought they were, they were so responsive. Like I, when we were listening to all of the different teams come to present to us their programs, I already seemed very enthusiastic, very open-minded, very much like involved, like, hey, if you have a problem, reach our customer service and we'll get back to you. And we had the training during the pilot. And if we had a question, they got back to us right away with an email or a text or some, some kind of something to, to address. Our, so that's like really positive, optimistic. Um, so some of the things weren't ready for our pilot because they aren't ready. In general, just I ready had doesn't have the 2024 edition done. But it seems like they have a great tech team, a great team that is responsive. So when I said, hey, I don't know what else is better or worse, it's just because I haven't, I, we didn't pilot any of the other ones. But their presentation was, we didn't even want to pilot a different one. We, we were going to pilot two things. We were going to pilot two different programs. And we said as a team, hey, do we have to pilot two or can we just really delve into this one. So that was like our number one choice. So I, I think it has a lot of great things to offer. And just hearing you guys tonight, like that's like the same. And it's a 2024 edition. So it's not like we're going to be on people's <laughs> That was, <laughs> that's one of the things I was thinking too, because a lot of times if it's not green on ed reports, schools aren't picking it up and it's going to go out of print. And that's what these publishing companies do. Every four years, they're coming out with a new product. And if they weren't green to begin with, their product's failing. <laughs> and so that's, this is also a company that's been around. And, you know, that, you know, I do wonder about the diagnostic tool and the computer time. Like, how are we going to mesh that in with the lesson? Yeah. Um, because I do know from experience that finding the minutes to get them onto that program um, is part of the, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for people to think about their schedule. So the other thing, the program is also designed for 45 to 50 minute um, lesson delivery. And then they recommend no more than three times a week of 15 minutes on the MyPath. And so we have already uh, laid some of that groundwork with our um, uh, administrators. We'll do more work because they will have an iReady session as well. Um, but that's something that we are, have um, talked about. So that because the MyPath has a level of artificial intelligence that does have the capability to instruct certain levels of kids if we allow it, but we're not that we don't need to do that. We still, we have okay. teachers for a reason and they yeah. still need a uh, personal touch and someone monitoring that. The diagnostic piece, same thing, mm -hmm. similar to when we brought the MAP system in, we will also adjust to the amount of time that we're taking for that. There was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, there's some preparation that goes in with getting kids ready for the diagnostic. Like, and uh, the cool thing about the diagnostic had like a brain break too, mm -hmm. I thought was cool. And like you did a little bit of work, play a game. Did a little bit of work, play a game. Um, so we'll balance that with the amount of, also the amount of assessment that we're doing too. So you know, we're gonna do some work around that. Yeah, it's just something that I ask myself, my own child is addicted to screens. And, you know, how much time during the school day in elementary are we spending on these screens doing work? Because um, I think they do need that, that discussion time. They need to work with their peers and get away from the screen. That's, that's also a need. And I would also like to be clear that um, at the end of the committee meeting uh, last week, we asked for volunteers this evening. And so uh, this is the crew that signed up to come this evening um, and even wore some of their iReady gear. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I want to thank them um, and stuffed animals. Yep. Yeah. But they volunteered to come tonight. There was no twisting arms or anything. They totally jumped in. And so uh, we... We very much appreciate. Yeah, you and thank and your you. Feedback. Some of you have dealt with my children, and <laughs> 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 thank you also for coming to this evening meeting. It was amazing hearing yeah, from you. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah. We, we appreciate it. Thank you. I do have a couple other questions, um, mostly for 
Dr. Barber and, and uh, yeah. Um, not Dr. Barber, sorry. Not you. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Miller and Dr. College. Um, yeah, you, you guys are good. Although I will say, uh, one, one of you referred to uh, thanking the board for more in-service days. That's on the administration, and the, I'll, I'll give them full credit for making the recommendation. And, and I, I will give the board full credit for agreeing to it, but... <laughs> but <laughs> Yep. That's funny. Is it is it fair for me to say that we only surveyed on iReady? We didn't survey on the other two. Right. On because we, yeah. Yeah. we didn't okay. pilot um, those, and so we only surveyed right. on Understood. what we piloted. Yeah. Is it also fair for me to say, yeah, I understand the limitations of trying to do the pilot within the PSSA um, confine. Mm -hmm. Is, is it worth putting off taking it to the board for a month to do further examination or are we pretty comfortable? I would say we're pretty comfortable. And um, it sounded that way, yes. but you know. Yeah, I think the angst was the timing. Mm -hmm. However, honestly, I know like the beginning of the year is not a good time to do a pilot. Would mm -hmm. an ideal world be a full year pilot? But um we didn't, don't have that luxury. No, I, I appreciate it. I, and I, so yeah. I feel pretty confident. And I like even in speaking with other colleagues out in the county um, and with other people, I feel like a lot of what um, is embedded in the iReady program is um, what will benefit our students. Mm -hmm. And well, the, fact I, I, I the, the discussion, mm -hmm. that's something that um, came out of other areas that we would need to to grow on and i think this is giving the tools right. the teachers need mm -hmm. my l looking at new programs is informed by my first two or three months on the board when <laughs> fontas and pinnell was presented to us and mm -hmm. that obviously did not work out the way we wanted it to and Ms. Perry, I remember you calling me at one point and saying, have you seen the Ed reports on Fadis and Fidel? This was a year after we approved it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the Ed reports were poor. Mm -hmm. um, I just looked at the Ed reports for iReady. Mm -hmm. They're very yeah. good. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm yeah. very pleased to see that. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into another um, boondoggle around a program for the district. So mm -hmm. it, it sounds like we're in good shape there and I, I appreciate that piece. Um, that being said, you know, if we are making a bad decision, we're allowed to make, we, we try to make the best decisions we can, mm -hmm. but as you know, I don't wanna try and go down a bad path just cause we're on that path. Mm -hmm. So yes. that being said. And the last piece I wanna bring up, what we're, it was referred to, but I just want to make sure we're comfortable with the ELD support that is in this program. Okay. Yes, so yeah. um, Brenna, um, I, you know, when we reviewed all of the uh, curriculum, we have Brenna with us as the teaching and learning team. And then on the math committee, we expanded the committee itself um, to include our ELD and special educators. Uh, because those were the two areas that we needed to make sure we had good representation to review the materials, to ensure the supports were actually there, because some programs can say they have those supports, but they not have, they really not have them. Mm -hmm. um, and as you heard tonight, the discourse, students are actually talking and having the accessibility to talk. Um, all of those are embedded, um, as well as um, and on the sheet that we, um, we reference with the ELD support, with the discourse cards, there is training that comes in for our educators on how to teach that part of the lesson for academic language and mm -hmm. to encourage language and what that means for all students, but more importantly, second language learners. There's a um, multilingual glossary, yeah. so um, to help with math terms mm -hmm. in different languages to help bridge Mm -hmm. So it does um, have a lot of ELD support. I know one of the comments and concerns is the word problems are wordy, um, which isn't, I can't say it, but it's any other way. It's an oxymoron. 
word problems are <laughs> wordy um, because they are indeed word problems. And so what we have to do is help our students access the word problems because text all around them every day is going to be challenging. And so um, I know one of the thoughts was, well, is there a program that has less wordy word problems? And that doesn't exist. Um, and it's not good <laughs> mathematical practice either. Um, our kids need to be able to dissect text. Um, so that, um, and there's careful, careful attention to help support students to digest text. So like, you know, Ms. Perry said in the beginning, math used to be, if you see the word less, then, you know, I'm going to subtract. It's way more than that. Right. And um, built into each unit um, by the language levels, according to our um, students and, and the witted descriptors and the can do's, it will give the teachers a starting point. Like level one, this is where you can access for students who have very limited um, right up to they're in level three, but they're stuck. So you can help with that academic language and discourse. So where teachers used to really struggle with like, what do I even do? That is embedded in the program, which is, I think one of the things, one of the selling points for the committee was the amount of supports that sit in here for all students, because it's not just- One of the things linked into the, yeah, committee, in the document, um, into that document um, is all of the, the language supports. Yes. Um, and that's good for, that's best practice for all students. I did also want to mention that the high school math teachers did not vote because they didn't pilot, mm -hmm. but Dr. Tamargo and Ms. Carpenter were very supportive of these materials. They were at all of the math committee meetings, okay. so all of the presentations, listened to all the discussions, and they feel like this is really the right direction for us to move. They were impressed with the, the content of the, um, the lessons and how it was laid out for teachers to instruct at the elementary level. Nice. Um, for the future, do we usually do one pilot or um, two? What is the norm? That we so we don't really, that I can correct me if I'm wrong, but unfortunately we don't we have in the last 17 years that I've been here, don't really have a typical norm. Um, would we like to work toward a typical norm? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but as you heard some of the teachers say, like this was the first time that like the PD happened while the pilot was going on. So, so different things. Right. Um, and uh, uh, so when we met with the math committee, we, we were all like, okay, so let's pilot two. They were very committed um, to saying that iReady was the one they wanted to pilot because they also knew that math and focus, they wanted to do a comparison. So essentially, we did kind of do a mini pilot comparative. We knew what was sitting in Math and Focus 2020. We had the materials since springtime, uh, but they were pretty adamant they wanted to give one a pilot. They did not, there was not high marks for reveal or illustrative um, just because the supports were there, but in some cases it wasn't teacher friendly or illustrative was very open um, ended, too open-ended for them, and they were worried about the resources and the packaging of them and those types of things and the online supports. So the team, we actually had left it to the committee um, to pilot. Typically, you would love to have a two-program mm -hmm. pilot so you can do some comparison of the data. But what we did with this one is we compared our current data to the data output that was happening with iReady and the diagnostic. Mm -hmm. What I'm really heartened to hear from the teachers is that they were excited about the methodology. Yes. That it wasn't just like, oh, does this cover all the topics I needed to cover? Right. Because that used to be the way that we did things. We charged through and made sure we hit every topic. And I think more and more instruction is turning into what, wait, we needed them to understand, <laughs> yes. not just cover it. We need to go in depth and make sure they were analyzing and discussing. And I think that they showed a lot of excitement about that and they paid attention and taught those routines before they piloted, which, you know, to me as an instructional coach, I'm like, wow, they've already, they already know what to do. <laughs> so give them materials and they're going to do it. It's very exciting. Yeah, yeah and, and single pilot, I mean, it's not, in my industry, I mean, it, basically people will do 
you know, RFPs and demos trying to narrow things down. And once they, they have the one they think fits their need, then they will pilot to see if they want to write the check. Right. So, um, you know, dual pilots are just mm -hmm. very intense yeah. on time consuming, yeah. intense on people yeah. trying to do their job at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not unusual to do just a single yep. pilot. Once all the due diligence is done leading up to that one that you want to write the check for. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, and then the other really um, interesting thing about iReady is we will look at, at a multi-year commitment. So the one thing that the committee asked, it was a very great, I wrote it down, I've never forgotten it. It was a great question because what you've run into is when they release a new version of the curriculum, then you're right back here purchasing new. But they said if we uh, make that multi-year commitment, anytime they update, they send out new materials. So that's already embedded, and it was one of the only programs, I believe, that when we reviewed that, that was the case. Um, so everything that um, we would have it for that year, those years of commitment. And we have uh, a three-year quote, and we have a six-year quote. Um, and so uh, we would be pretty committed to it, and that would put us on, put our elementary team on a very good curriculum cycle, because uh, we are working diligently to get them on to a very, so we're not doing something new every year. Um, they are aware of yes. this situation that's putting our teachers in. Yes. Any other questions? All right. All right. Okay. So I have for you tonight this uh, textbook. Oh, Mike. Thank you. I have for you tonight this uh, textbook um, for your consideration. It's for our environmental uh, science class, the AP class at the high school. Um, they are currently using the 2015 edition of this book. Bye, everybody. Uh, it's, it's like the sound of music. Um, oh, environmental science. We'll see you later. Gotta go. Gotta go. <laughs> um, so Mr. Rapogel and two of his colleagues reviewed three different books. Um, and decided that of all of the texts that they looked at, that this one was the strongest. As I said, currently they're using the second edition of this textbook. This is the fourth edition of this textbook. So this will be available at the uh, district office for you to review and will come for a vote at the May school board meeting. It has. Where are the iReady and the environmental science textbook going to be housed during that time period when the community can come look? So um, I'll have to talk to Dr. Blakey, but we would like to house it at the uh, district office. So we have a good centralized location. So uh, once we make the announcement, we'll have parents come there and they can review the materials if they want our community. Um, and we'll, we can make that announcement. At the, I'd like to announce that at this May school board meeting so that everyone knows they're up for review. Um, and then that way we have them housed at the deal. Now, if anyone would like to take the AP book this evening to review, a little light reading for this evening. You may. Um, otherwise, we'll put it at the district office um, yes. in case anyone would like to look at it. <laughs> no. No. All right. All right. I think we're good. Okay. So with that, um, we'll conclude our meeting. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you all for coming out. All right, we're done.